Hello everybody and welcome to a smoking tire special. We're gonna go on eBay Motors, buy some cars, buy some parts, and then meet up for a series of challenges. I don't know what Matt did to his car, but it's not gonna compete with this. <laughs> Look what I have done. Peel up the toupee on the steering wheel. <laughs> Scandy flick. Oh! Yeah. He's lost the home oh, oh, baby! That's a lot of hits, that's a lot of hits. Hey folks, welcome to the 2022 Subaru WRX. Yes. It is all new, actually. It's weird, because in some ways it looks all new, in some ways it looks like a facelift. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of have to park it a little side by side with the other one to really tell the difference. But, yes. But in fact, it shares no body panels with the regular Impreza. Right. Uh, it's got this fairly wonky plastic cladding over the wheel arches, mm -hmm. which I sort of think is the same thing as like the first gen Chevy Volt. If you get the car in black, you won't see the weird shapes. Yeah, I got a lot of DMs that were like, it looks good in darker colors. So I was right. like, of course it does, because yeah. the cladding is dark. The darker colors hide the uh, the cladding. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's tough to ignore. Uh, the best place to be uh, to avoid the cladding is inside the car. <laughs> you can't see it from inside the car. I learned that when driving the first gen Porsche Cayenne. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, see? Exactly. Um, most noticeable improvement, actually, is the big 11.6-inch touchscreen in the middle. Uh, pretty much the same as what we saw on the Outback Wilderness. Right. Uh, it does bring the WRX's interior sort of mostly up to the 21st century. It does, because the old screen was like six and a half inches, which, I mean, is half this size. So this does look a little bit more, yeah, up and to the, the current UI, century. And the UI, you know, it's got more of an iPad you know, tablet, modern-looking interface. Mm -hmm. In most ways, it's good. In a couple ways, it's bad. It takes a couple extra clicks to get to things like the heated seats and some yeah, of the I mean, and it's a little slow. It's like you tap and you wait one and a half seconds, and then you tap and you wait like one. So it's a little bit, it's not as quick as your phone, right. which means your eyes are off the road for just a little bit longer. Right. Most importantly, though, we have a new engine. Yes. 2.4 liter uh, flat four. The numbers don't tell the whole story because it's 271 horsepower, 258 pound-feet of torque. That's only three horsepower and no torque different from the last yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On paper, they look almost the same. Right, but the idea with the new engine is that the larger displacement gives you a little more to work with on the bottom end, so it's not quite as zingy, mm -hmm. and if you're just kind of puttering around town, it's not as laggy. Right, but and also, they use this engine in the Ascent and the Outback, and the two liter they don't use in anything anymore. So it's it's obviously gonna save them some money to use this engine. Right, uh, the car's longer and wider than the last model. Um, it has a, a whole new architecture, so it has a lower center of gravity than before. It has a stiffer chassis than before, which allows them to use softer suspension than before, and we'll get to that in a minute. 12.4-inch uh, front brakes, 11.4-inch rear brakes, 245 18-inch Dunlop SP Sport Max tires all around. Uh, and you can get an adaptive suspension, but only if you get an automatic transmission. CVT. Which sucks. Yes. This being the limited, this is the most expensive manual gearbox model they will sell you. So let's drive it and see if it's good. is 12 PSI down from 15.9 but you can also run it on 87 octane now mm. before you had to use 91 so that is a good improvement for, good for your wallet good for your wallet exactly. and good for longevity I mean less boost means ultimately less stress which means the engine in theory should last longer yeah, I mean, this engine, like I said, is used in some of their larger cars, which do have tow ratings of like 5,000 pounds. So you're not towing anything with this engine. So it's definitely less stressed. And I think that'll be a gift to the aftermarket when they start turning the boost up and putting mods on it. It should make a, a considerable more power than the last one. The ride up here is pretty good, which is interesting. It reminds me of the car I built for our All Cars Go to Heaven 
series, which was fundamentally a rally car with rally shocks, right? Right. On this bumpy canyon road, the car really absorbs the big bumps and the cracks pretty well. But on the freeway, and in, in town, in the city, the ride is awful. <laughs> it was really surprising. Really surprising. And it's apparently, although I haven't been back there, I can trust my wife who has good judgment. She says the ride is r- worse in the back. She said it's got a shimmy on the highways. Now, granted, the highways in our uh, city are terrible. They are garbage. But even with all the different cars we drive in this in this city, I was surprised at how s- oh, it felt oversprung. Yeah, it's bouncy. Yeah. And on the 405's expansion joints, I could see the hood bouncing a little bit. I, w- I actually, for about 15 seconds, wondered, d- did Zach leave the hood unlatched? I did some mods. Yeah, I, like, I thought you might have left the hood unlatched when you brought me the, the car because it I, it was vibrating and I thought it might actually fly up. Now, it wasn't and it didn't, but it kind of sketched me out a little bit. It's funny that the structure is like 30% more rigid, but that doesn't mean the body panels are right. necessarily super solid. But, you know, the, the suspension, they have to compromise. You know, we, did, we want it to feel sporty and be agile in the corners where you're driving fast, which is what a lot of the owners of these do. It, and you don't want to spend a lot of money, it's going to have a compromise, and that's going to be around town. Right, and it's also... Uh, and it's also... Uh, uh, it still feels a little thin and tinny, Right. It's still a little bit, like when you close the door, it's a little thung. It's got like a a drum effect to it. Um, It just feels a little thin. And I suppose that contributes to it being lightweight. Yep. But, uh, because what is it, 3,300 pounds? Yeah, it's just over 3,300. And then this new one, I think, uh, base to base compared to the old one, is only like three pounds heavier. So they did a good job of adding more features and making the car larger without adding weight. Now, it might be this press car, because who knows where this thing has been, and it's 1,700 miles before us. But for 12 and a half inch front brakes and 11 and a half inch rear brakes on a 3,300 pound car, the pedal feels a little soft to me. Mm. A little extra pedal travel, a little lack of certainty that the car might stop in time. And I have to, to heel toe. I'm trying to do two things at once with my right foot, but I feel my I find myself having to apply more brake force on the left side, which makes it harder to use the right side. Now Zach should drive now and uh, and let us know if he agrees with me. But in the meantime, I should tell you that this video is brought to you by Heel and Toe Apparel, who make this delightful driving themed. Uh, Shirts, hats, yeah, yeah. accessories, all this good stuff. If you can't buy a manual transmission car, if you can't support saving the manuals with a five-figure vehicle purchase, maybe get a t-shirt. Yeah. Maybe get a sticker. Maybe get a More hat. Affordable. Hit the link in the description to do some of that up. Now, Zach, your turn. It feels quick from this side. It does. It's pretty. It's pretty quick. It's pretty stout. I don't remember the numbers to be honest, but I think zero to sixty is in the high fours. Now tell me that that brake pedal doesn't feel a little soft. Let's see. Let me go again to here, this corner. Uh, yeah. A I soft, think. Right? I think a lot of modern sporting cars, almost regardless of price, have brought that peak pressure closer to the top of travel and they're really responsive, and I feel like we've gotten used to that. So I think the question for me is like, what? if we get deep in the pedal, does it still have good braking force? I mean, that, oh no, it does feel mushy. It feels mushy. Yeah, it doesn't really stiffen up. Yeah, now it's possible this car has just had the crap kicked out of Very it. Very true. Uh, maybe someone boiled the brake fluid, but it, the, considering the speed, and the speed is pretty good, I want a little more brake. Yeah, you're gonna want you're gonna want pads on this thing yeah. if you're doing canyon stuff or any kind of track stuff or autocross. Now the shifter, I may be a little spoiled with the CT5 Blackwing, which had a brilliant shifter. Now, should we listen to it? Fourth gear. 
you don't really hear anything. You, you hear don't. a little bit of the boxer sound from the front, but not a ton. It's got that just a little tiny snarl. A little bit of that yeah, kind but, of snarl. But you're, you're, not, uh, you're not really hearing the exhaust in the car. You're hearing more road noise, wind noise, and a little bit of, I think, intake. Yeah, uh, the, the shifter, as you were saying. It's a little bit... It's just not as it's not as direct as the CT5. Now we're talking that's a six-figure car, okay. But let's talk about the $30,000 Honda Civic SI, which has the shifter right out of the Civic Type R, which is second only to Porsche in shifter satisfaction. I it's agree. Porsche GT3 and then Honda Civic SI. I agree. I think Honda sets the bar for, for cheap cars absolutely. So Anything less than that is going to be less than that. And this, I don't, I think this is cable actuated. I'll it put feels a like third. a cable. Most of them are cable actuated these days, but this feels cable actuated, which means like you just don't feel those guides on the side. It yeah. feels like it's just light in, in terms of feel. You don't really, the gauges are where you expect them to be, but you don't feel it going through each gate. I feel like if I really was ripping through gears, like, like drag racing that I could possibly rip the shift off. Yeah, yeah, it does like, feel like that. It feels, it's like, it's a little fragile, isn't it? Feeling? Hazard lights, interesting. Oh, what is that about? Who? Oh, mm. uh, do we okay. think some? do we want to go right? Yeah. Go right. Upper big to hunger. Double hazard lights. Bail. Bail, double hazard lights. Part of me like wants to see what that is. Yeah. Other part of me. Doesn't want to get in a traffic doesn't jam. Doesn't want to be in a traffic jam. So, I noticed the car feels Agile, it feels like a corner's pretty flat. I mean, those, those stiff springs, like you said, they come into play out here and they pay dividends. I mean, the steering is quick, they quicken the ratio a little bit. Um, the turning radius is awesome in this car, even though the car is a little longer and the turning radius is not as good as the last generation. I, when I made a U turn last week, I was like, oh, for an all wheel drive car, very impressive. I think Cooked, that man. part of that is because it's the longitudinal setup and not a big transverse setup with a Haldex thing. That's That transverse setup with all-wheel drive is how the turning radiuses get really fucked up. It takes up all the space. Yeah, yeah. Also, like, from a practical perspective, it's pretty roomy. Yes. You know, like, you can fit four adults in here pretty easily. Zach has a lot of room behind him right now. I could easily sit behind Zach. Uh, there's a lot of storage. There's four full-size USB ports, so every person in the car can be charging their phone. There's a 12 volt. There's like cup holders in the center, bottle holders in the side. It, it is very practical. The trunk is pretty big uh, for a sedan. The one thing I do I did notice, and it's hard for me to kind of kind of work around, is that I do feel like I'm sitting up on top of it and not down in it. I wish the seat was mounted, especially the driver's seat, an inch lower, or you could lower it just a little more. I can really see that the steering shaft is going up, and the dash is down here. Um, now, it's not like I'm hitting my head on the roof, but I do feel like I'm sitting up on top of it and not down in it. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. And this is the limited WRX, but the driver's seat is automatic and yours is manual yeah and they are very different in terms of uh, how comfortable they are they are I'm sitting I feel like I'm even higher over here and with that with the lack of adjustability the lack of the lumbar and stuff like that um, it it's the same seat but it just it feels like it's positioned so differently yeah the, the pricing of this is so strange to me that like the limited used to be the nicest one but now it's the second nicest one the nicest one is the GT, where you get the good suspension, but you have to get it with the CVT, which is not fun. You also can't get radar cruise or a bunch of the driver safety features, you know, the adaptive safety stuff, which, you know, I could go without some of the adaptive safety stuff, but, but it's not like having a manual gearbox precludes you from using radar cruise. Right. There are other cars you can buy with manual transmissions and radar cruise. That explains all the blank buttons over here because there <laughs> yeah. are four. There are uh, eight buttons and four of them are blank. Wow. All right. I think I'll find a place to pull over. Uh, uh, at speed, it's really composed. It corners flat. It feels very sure-footed. The steering feels nice and it doesn't get upset over bumps 
But in the city, it just feels really stiff. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why I feel like I'm missing out on those adaptive shocks. I haven't tried them. I can't tell you if they make it better or not, but I feel like it can't make it worse. Well, I think our experience with adaptive shocks is that usually it gives you the right. uh, the both. You get to have your cake and eat it too. We're making assumptions. So, is it good? I think it is. I think it is. I think it does a lot of things well, and that's what you want from this car. It's like a go everywhere all the time vehicle. Yeah, in general, I think it's pretty well rounded. It's it, there's some obvious cost cutting here mm-hmm. and there, but that's why it you know you can get this kind of performance for thirty thousand dollars, thirty two. We have they haven't released prices yet, so we're guessing this is about thirty four grand. That's that's our best guess. Um, and objectively, there are a lot of features and practicality, space, performance for that price. Right. Um, you definitely are going to want some some brake pads and some high temp fluid because these things are smoked. Yeah. Um, and the pedal's really soft. And and you may want to uh, you know consider a different wheel and tire combination. I don't know if these Dunlops are contributing to the noise in the cabin. It's kind of loud. Mm-hmm. It um, is on the highway. It's a pretty noisy place to sit. Yeah, it's yeah. not it's not as refined as I would expect the Volkswagen to be, or even the Honda Civic Si, which is shockingly quiet and refined. Um, it's the only car in its class with all-wheel drive, right. so that's a thing, right? For sure, and that goes a long way depending on where you live. Um, but the trade-off is in you know some other other places. So, yeah. um, I, I I I like it most of the time, most of the time. But there's some stuff that that I might have a hard time. The shifter feel, the soft brakes, like that stuff might start to stick with me over time. And there may be upgrades yeah. down the line that you can get in the aftermarket, maybe. It really just depends on what, where you live and what you want to do with the car. To me, this is like, you take the Corolla we drove, it was yeah. 27 grand, nice, loaded, all that stuff, but, but slow. slow as hell. Yeah. Couldn't even tell what gear you were in, yeah. and it's front wheel drive only. So yeah. this is like that little bigger and now you have all-wheel drive and a turbocharger. If I didn't need to drive it in snow, the Civic SI is a nicer place to be. It is. And we're driving the GTI next week. Right. So we'll talk about that when we, once we've had a go. Um, but but in terms of inputs, seat comfort, inputs and space for the price, the Civic SI beats this with the exception of all-wheel drive. Everything else I'd rather have the Civic SI. Um, but as far as composure at speed, um, power in the higher gears, this does a better job than that than that Civic. Well, they changed gears three, four, five in this from the last one. I forgot about that. So the ratios are are uh, shorter, so the acceleration is a little bit better. Well, that helps too for sure. The Civic Si dies a bit after fourth gear. Um, so thanks to Subaru for letting us have a go. Thanks to you guys for watching. Hit the link in the description to get some of this heel and toe apparel gear. Shirts, hoodies, stickers, hats, the whole lot, you name it. Uh, We got a special code for you guys if you use that link. And uh, we'll see you guys later. Bye. And remember, always fight your tickets. Use code TST10 on the Off The Record app available in the Android and iOS store or go to offtherecord.com slash TST.